food. Plentiful food is vitally important to your well-being, your lifestyle, your ability to work. In North America, we are blessed with an abundance of food, even during a pandemic. In Canada, we're extremely fortunate, says John Jamieson of the Canadian Center for Food Integrity. He goes on to say the average Canadian grocery store has 50,000 items in it. We have tremendous choice, and we know that the food is safe to consume. Despite the robust nature of our food system, the CCFI in its 2019 Public Trust Research Survey found that only one in three Canadian consumers believe Canada's food system is headed in the right direction, and another large segment of the population isn't so sure. How can this be? Canada not only feeds itself, it also exports in excess of $57 billion of food annually to countries around the world. Jameson says those countries boast about Canadian food as a benchmark in quality, and yet we are seeing a disconnect here at home. Jameson says agriculture today is based on science and technology. We're able to produce more per acre. We're able to feed more people per acre because we do a good job of what we do and we use the tools that are available to us and in doing so we produce safe food. There's so many checks and balances. There are inspectors at every stage along the way. Industry associations have codes of practice and processors have regulations and requirements they must follow. As consumers, we rely on the system, that system of checks and balances. And we may have thoughts and ideas about how our food is produced, but how many of us actually know much or anything about food production? In Canada, most people are two or three generations away from a family member who farmed. And food production back then is nothing like it is today. I decided to find out if our food is safe, reliable, and sustainable. So over the next 12 months, I will be dedicating one episode a month to food, food production, food science, food nutrition, and food in the environment. I'm calling the series Food for Thought. In episode number one, I invited John Jamieson, the CEO of the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity, to join us for a conversation that matters about the safety and integrity of Canada's food supply. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. John, what is the Canadian Center for Food Integrity? Our mandate is to help organizations build public trust in agriculture and food. So we do a number of things such as research where we look at the attitudes of Canadians toward our food system. We provide resources, uh, policy analysis, and we also do communications directly to the consumer. Why is it needed? Our job and the industry's job is realized over the last few years, we need to have a conversation with Canadians. We need to talk to them about how their food is produced. We need to answer their questions. And maybe sometimes we actually need to think about changing the way we do things and adapting. And a lot of what we do is, I like to say that Canadians expect progress, not perfection. So if we can communicate that we're doing a better job around climate change, that we're, we're taking better care of the environment, that we're looking after our workers better, then it, it helps build that trust. And that's really important as we, as we go forward. In reading your survey from 2019 about the levels of trust about food amongst Canadians, it looks like the numbers may have stabilized a little bit, but we've been going in a direction where people are losing confidence in the integrity of the system. What do you think are the underlying reasons for that? A greater number of Canadians have seen that or thought that the food system is going in the wrong direction. And I think there's a number of reasons why that has happened. I think the advent of social media and the ability to have, for anyone to have a platform and not necessarily based on, on and more based on opinion than the fact, the, the fact that more and more of us are disconnected from how our food is grown and the fact that there's just so much information out there. And, and there's also been the, the activists that are, that are not happy with the way 
food is produced, have been very good at getting their messaging across. So I think Canadians and people all around the world get mixed messaging around how their food is produced. So that creates a certain level of, of, of maybe not angst, but not exactly confidence in the system. And I think that's what reflected in our numbers. So of course, one of the major issues at play here, and I think this makes it very difficult for people to grasp, is we want our food to be affordable. Yet, we want it to be as healthy as possible. Are those conflicting perspectives, or can we have them both? I think we have both right now. Canadians have, on a, per, on a, on a percentage of your income, we have the second lowest food costs in the world. The Americans have about 6% of their income they spend on food. Canada is around 9 The Europeans are in the teens, but a lot of the world is 20 30 40% or more of their income. They just want to eat. Where we have the ability to make choices, we can choose whether we want to have chicken tonight or fish or beef or, or we want to have non-GMO or genetics or, or uh, whatever. Um, because we do have an affordable food system. The other thing we do have, though, is a system that is very safe, that is very healthy. And, you know, a number of years ago, we looked at uh, OECD countries, and Canada tied with Ireland as having the safest food in the world, having the best food system in the world. So we, we have that now, but that is a challenge to our producers, our people that are processing our food, because when the commodity prices haven't changed a whole lot in many, many years, so they have to figure out how do we do this more efficiently. At the same time, society is layering on expectations of them to do a better job of the environment, to make sure that our animals are well cared for, and, and that's all legitimate, but there, there are a number of expectations that they have today that they didn't have years ago. The prices haven't changed, so they so that's a that's a big struggle for our community, farm community and for the processors that are processing the food because they have expectations of them they have uh, so it's 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 a real challenge to produce high quality food in the system we have but we're very fortunate that we're able to do that most canadians have no real relationship with that system they don't really know what are the elements that create certainty and security around food that's, I think, the biggest challenge around public trust. We have an extremely complex food system. There are regulations that are in place by the federal government. There are regulations in place by provincial governments. There are regulations in place by municipal governments. There are uh, industry standards. There is a complex, it's a complex system that's based on science and technology. And it's really difficult sometimes to communicate that in relatively simple terms to a consumer that's not connected to the food system. The rest of the question is, when I have an understanding of how that system works, how do I then start to develop a level of trust in the whole system? Yeah, well, I think the first thing we have to do is we need to connect with consumers. We have to, and I like to say this, you need to think about the shoes that are facing you. Think about the person that you're communicating with. What are their values? What are their interests? How do we, how do we have shared values? Because the, the people who are producing our food and putting it on the table care about the environment, for example. They have the, by and large, we have the same values as the average Canadian. So how do we connect that way? How do we put a human face on what we do? And the other thing is, how do we help people understand that our food system is a number of interconnected pieces that work together? So you have the person who's selling, for example, animal feed. And then you have the farmer who's producing the food. And then you have the trucker that's moving that, that animal to the plant. And then you have the plant that's processing it. And then you have the wholesaler and you have the retailer and the restaurants. So it's a number of pieces. And everyone plays a role in taking that seed from here and getting it on the table here. And we, we need to celebrate those pieces and, and help communicate all those different pieces. So the question then becomes, who does the consumer of the food trust? So by and large, our research shows that people want to hear from the farmer, the person that is getting their hands dirty, that is working in the land, that's working with the animals every day, that there's a high level of trust there. But there are other pieces of the farm, of the, of the food system that are also trusted. 
people tend to trust university researchers in, in certain areas. They, they trust veterinarians when you're talking about um, animal welfare. So what we need to do is coordinate our messaging and coordinate our activities so that we have some consistent messaging from a variety of places. I was once talking to a dietitian who said the only biological thing that you do more often than eat is breathe. And so what we consume is vitally important to us and it's important to our well-being. And I noticed in your research that this is a topic that really matters to people, especially as they age. Is this food going to ensure that I'm going to be able to maintain my health? So in Canada, are we able to say, yes, you can? We are able to say yes. And, and uh, again, when you talk about who to best communicate that message, we know that dietitians in terms of food safety and health, but also farmers too, but dietitians have a lot of respect and one of the things that we do a fair bit of is working with dietitians so that they understand all the different parts of the food chain. We did a, an activity here a little while ago where we had uh, dietitians from two of the larger uh, retail uh, supermarket chains in Canada. So we sent them out a survey and said, what do you want to know about food production? They come back with the responses. So we tailored a webinar around those responses to talk to them about this is this is why we do things a certain way and we had a farmer from Saskatchewan who, who joined us on the webinar and he he put that that authenticity to the production side of things and and uh, so we spend a fair bit of time working with dietitians because we know that they're a conduit to the consumer to talk about those healthy outcomes that are very important in our food that brings up an interesting point we're producing all of this food and less than 0.2% of Canadians are producing more than 80% of it. That means, by extension, that most Canadians are at least two if not three generations away from direct farming. This in turn has led to the idea that food is produced by big corporations rather than by family-run businesses, which isn't the case. Most farms, even farms of consequence, are third or fourth generation family-owned businesses that run modern, sustainable operations. None of which fits with a romanticized vision of how food is supposed to be produced. And that is by some guy standing on a plow being pulled by six horses. The idea is that that's the person I trust to produce safe, quality food. To help people understand how the system works, do we have to disabuse them of those romantic images of the past? I have a photo on my wall in, in, in Charlottetown, and it was a farmer standing in a barn, and the, and the ceiling was just barely above his head, and there was fluorescent lights, and there was the cows were tied up, and their tails were tied up. And everyone that came into my office would look at that and say, I love that photo. And I'd say, well, let's talk about that photo. Ceilings are low, there's no natural light, there's poor ventilation, there's dust on the floor, there's probably a good healthy population of rodents, the cows are tied up, in fact, their tails are tied up. I said, and they've torn that barn down, they built a new one. And the new one is much larger, although it has the same number of animals in it. And it has curtains that go up and down with the temperature, and there's fresh air, and there's, there's the ability for the cows to get scratched whenever they want. But if you were driving down the road, most people would gravitate toward that 1950s model of ag instead of what, what they refer to as industrial. Agriculture today is based on science and technology. We, we, we are able to produce more per acre. We're able to feed more people per acre because we do a good job of what we do. And we use, we use the tools that are available to us. None of us would want to go to a dentist that's using 1950s technology. But for some reason, Many people think that that's, that's the model that our food system should follow. So we have to communicate the values of that, those innovations to the community. So the farm that's behind me is creating a lot more production out of an acre of land today than they would have probably 10 or 15 years ago and doing it with less water, less input on in the environment. And we haven't done a very good job of communicating the values of that system to the consumer because that allows us to go to a grocery store and pick out what we want. The average grocery store has 50,000 items in it. It allows us to have that choice and it allows us to do other jobs. 
and, and, and to do what's important because people like the folks behind me do a really good job of producing our food. And, and you know, if you want to talk about value to the environment, the more production you can get per acre, that means the more land that can be left for natural purposes. One of the key components in the production of food, of course, is water. And you've mentioned a couple of times using less water. But you've talked about being more productive with less water. What has happened that has allowed us to be able to make a statement like that? Well, one of the things is uh, no-till. Uh, 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 soil management is much better today. Um, our, our cattle are, are designed and, and in, uh, genetics are better to grow, to grow better. We just have, uh, you know, the irrigation systems that we're using today are much more efficient than they were in the past. And just the fact that plant breeding allows plants to do a better job of, of converting energy to, to food. You talked about no tilling. So if you want to be an organic farmer, you have to till. You have little to no choice. So what are the advantages of not tilling for the soil on farms of consequence? Well, no till allows, when, when, every time you turn over the soil, you're exposing the soil to the elements around it. It's fairly windy today. So if you're turning over that soil, the ability is there for that that soil will blow away. You know that's why we had the Dust Bowl in the, in the 1930s. By not by not turning that soil over, you're allowing the integrity of the soil to remain. And that's and that's one of the things that farmers and scientists have spent a lot of time on in the last number of years is soil health. And what is real soil health? Organic production does require because you you still have pests to deal with, and and that's one of the challenges that the average person who doesn't understand agriculture and say, well, you know, if you go organic, you just go organic. But they, what they don't understand is you still have to manage weeds and pests and you just have to figure out a different way to do it. A lot of times it's through tillage. I had a farmer tell me years ago, he said, I went from conventional to organic, but he said, I think my footprint is the same because I'm using more fuel because I have to do more tillage, where in the past I used very little fuel, but I used pesticides. So it's, there, there's a balance there that you have to think about. But does the seed not also have to be the right seed for that environment that it's growing in? So if I'm going to grow barley, let's say, in southern Ontario where you are, it's going to have to be a little bit different than if it is being grown in northern Saskatchewan. The right fertility, uh, the right rate, the right, uh, the right time and the right seed that make, you know, everything has to line up. So the farmer that's producing food is actually quite a scientist when you think of it, because he's got to balance all these things in order to get a crop out of the ground and do it with a price that's been fairly stagnant for a number of years. So they're, they're quite a magician. But they have to work quite closely with the seed producers as well, because those seeds each year start with a heritage plant and then they're bred for the current conditions that we're in. And that's why I talk about the integration of the food system. So the farmer works with the agrologist, and the agrologist works with the with the uh, seed producer, and the seed producer works with the, you know, with, with again with the farmer and others. So that that integration is what allows our Canadian food system to be so strong. It's a very complex food chain, but it's one that you say is safe, secure, and that message needs to be delivered. I think we need to deliver that it's affordable, that it's available and that it's safe. And I think those are the three key messages that we have to, we have to stand behind. You know, our food is available. We are very fortunate in Canada that we can go into a grocery store and have choice of 50,000 products. And it's very safe. Like our system is so safe. There are so many checks and balances in there. You know, you have inspectors all along the way. You have, have industry associations that create uh, codes of practice that they have to follow. The, the processors have to follow, uh, uh, have certain requirements. So those, those are the messages, uh, the message of affordability, availability and safety that we need to connect with the consumer with. But you did talk earlier about this connection between agriculture and climate. Uh, people want to know this. Uh, what is the relationship? Our environmental footprint continues to drop. And again, I think 
Canadians expect progress rather than perfection. And, you know, while we may, agriculture certainly is a, is a component of greenhouse gas production. There's, there's no doubt about it. And I don't know, if we're, we're certainly not the, at, at the highest in Canada. I think transportation and, and heating homes and stuff like that is, is much higher. But I can't say that we're, we're, not in, we're not a factor because I think we are. But the fact is we recognize that and we're, we're taking the steps to reduce that, as is everyone. So if we're going to fight climate change, we all need to think about doing things differently, including the, 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 uh, the farm sector. If we're, going to, if we're going to make a difference in, in climate change, by and large, today we're seeing that because of the, the reduced travel and the pandemic, our greenhouse gas emissions have dropped significantly. But guess what? Agriculture is still operating pretty much the same as it did this time last year. So the drop in greenhouse gas emissions is because people aren't flying, people aren't driving. We all need to think about the role we can play. And the thing that I'm proud about in the food system is that every day someone gets up and says, how do we do this better? You know, we think of the commitment Maple Leaf made to becoming a, a zero emission company and the challenges that they have around that and the work that they have to do. The, the, the work that the food system is doing around no-till and, and, uh, and uh, genetics with different animals and, and sequestering carbon and capturing that methane. There's work being done. You know, are we having an impact? I think we are. Do we have an impact? Certainly we do. But I think as we progress to a better system, we will, and, it, and it's not about pointing a finger at a particular sector. It's about figuring out what can I do to make, it, make things different. Great. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Conversations That Matter, Food for Thought. Thank you, Stu.